good evening or good morning, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, something says uh, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, I, I shall just keep yourself. Okay. Um, thanks for having me. And uh, I, uh, Ibrat asked me uh, if I would uh, uh, reflect on and uh, talk about uh, my experiences of uh, what uh, management scholarship uh, uh, is, is like. Uh, uh, so I thought, okay, uh, I shall uh, try and begin with something quite personal. Um, let me say that uh, I am actually quite an accidental academic and probably quite untypical because unlike most uh, management academics, I spend uh, quite a substantial number of years in business and in the, in the, in the so-called real world before I uh, stumbled into academia. And, uh, and the reason for me uh, uh, eventually leaving uh, the business world and coming into academia was because I faced some uh, puzzles and predicaments which uh, I needed, I, I, I sought uh, some uh, answers to, so to speak. So that's the reason why I ended up in academia. I'm an accidental academic. I never planned to be an academic to, to, to start with. It was just to try to find some uh, uh, queer uh, answers to, to, to these uh, issues that I, I was confronted with uh, as a senior manage, uh, manager in a, in a large multinational. So just a brief uh, background uh, to give you some idea. How come? Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm from Singapore uh, and uh, lived, born and lived there for 39 years, nearly 40 years, uh, with uh, substantial years in, 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 experience, in business experience. And in the last 10 years, I was involved in managing a large computerized can manufacturing plant uh, uh, in a very global, competitive uh, global environment. Uh, and that's where most of my managerial experiences uh, uh, were uh, accumulated, uh, but and where I faced some of the dilemmas uh, that I thought uh, strange uh, that I couldn't find uh, a suitable uh, uh, answers to. So for that reason, I eventually left uh, the business world to pursue my PhD. So. What were some of these real world puzzles and problems? Well, I can give you some examples later, but uh, uh, general, uh, in, in general, I found that many, many of the theories and, and models and concepts that I had come across, uh, which when you try to apply them in practice, often proved uh, inadequate uh, in practice. Um, worse, uh, they sometimes, uh, end up uh, uh, causing uh, unintended con consequences to, to occur. So I couldn't fathom why this was the case. And uh, my entry into academia was to try to find uh, answers uh, uh, to these uh, intractable, seemingly intractable uh, predicaments. Uh, the third uh, uh, issue was uh, increasingly, and this is already in a, in the late 80s, already I had realized that the world was changing, becoming much more complex, much more uncertain and uh, uh, precarious, so to speak, uh, for, for, for the business leader. And the question then becomes, how can we act uh, to minimize some of these unintended consequences? So that's my main reason for getting in or for leaving the business world and getting into academic life. Um, one of my great discoveries was the work of uh, the uh, philosopher, the British philosopher, uh, uh, Alfred North Whitehead, who some of you may know about. Uh, he was a mentor to Bertrand Russell. Uh, he didn't, he wasn't, he didn't feature very prominently in Britain, but he ended up being in, in Harvard, uh, 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 and, 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 and made his reputation, so to speak, actually, in Harvard uh, University. Um, as a wonderful uh, uh, lecture that he gave at Harvard Business School in 1932, 
which uh, I would really uh, encourage you all to, to read it. And it is about the function of universities. So I'm going to refer to his work quite substantially in my talk. So what I basically am uh, going to try and cover in this uh, 40 minutes, perhaps, hopefully, are uh, about four points. First, what are universities really all about? Um, I have to tell you that uh, I don't have a first degree. I still don't have a first degree. Uh, I came into academia through professional uh, qualifications route. Uh, so for me, the idea of coming to a university was something special. And that is part of the reason why I asked myself, what does it mean to come to a university and what's the difference? Uh, uh, what difference does it have from the, outs from, from the outside world, so to speak? Uh, secondly, the meaning of academic scholarship. What, what is research really and education really all about? And something that I coined uh, quite a few years ago, I call it the entrepreneurial imagination. Uh, most people think about entrepreneurship as making money in the business world and so forth. But I believe that uh, one can be an academic entrepreneur. And by that, I don't mean an academic who's good at making money. I mean an academic who's good at uh, creating new, interesting ideas and making new, fresh connections. Uh, the world of the life of the mind, so to speak. That's the, uh, uh, the entrepreneurial imagination. And it a lot has to do, it has a lot to do uh, with thinking what I call the unthinkable. We'll come to this. And fourthly, uh, I want to introduce a concept which I have been toying with uh, for the last uh, six years or so. I call it relevation. A lot of, uh, there's a, been a lot of debate about academic rigor and its relevance to the outside world. I think this is a red herring. Uh, uh, genuine academic rigor uh, is eminently relevant, but only if you see the connections. Uh, relevance is not a static thing. Relevant, what, what was irrelevant in the past may become relevant in the future. Uh, think about your own education. When you were in school, uh, the teacher may have said something or thought something which you thought was not relevant. But in hindsight, 20 years later, you may find, my goodness, that was really significant. So the art of relevation is literally about making the seemingly irrelevant relevant. So let's start with the uh, universities. What are universities? So I, one of the first few things that I did when I came into academia was to explore the world of a university. What does it mean to be in a university? And I realized that in a, it is actually a very ancient tradition, nearly a thousand years old. Uh, if you go to uh, the, the universities in Europe, like uh, Bologna, Salamanca, the University of Paris, Oxford, Cambridge, these are over 800 years old. And some would even say uh, that uh, in Morocco, for example, there was a university that's uh, over a thousand years old. That may well be, have been the case. But, but these were places of contemplation uh, where it was about the promotion of the life of the mind, you know, about playing with ideas. In fact, a lot of universities uh, were where people uh, went away from the cities. Uh, so it's no surprise that many great universities are away from the big cities because that's uh, it, it was it was getting away to contemplate the uh, the, the the world the universe uh, in in this manner, and this is where I came across the work of uh, John Henry Newman in 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 a book that is called The Idea of a University. A university aims at raising the intellectual tone of society, at cultivating the public mind at purifying the national taste. Uh, it gives a man, a clear a man, a woman, of course, a clear conscious view of his her own view, opinions and judgments, a truth in developing them, an eloquence in expressing them, and a force in urging them. That's really what university life is about. It's about raising the quality of thinking uh, in society. 
Um, so the idea, for example, that uh, universities uh, provide solutions to societal problems only is not enough. Universities are places where you actually contemplate alternative uh, priorities for society. Uh, uh, reconfigure uh, what societies are about. So going into a university is participating in a tradition. I call it a vocation. And I guess I left uh, the business world to go into academia because I thought of it as a vocation. Uh, to, to enter this light, this world where people uh, engage and deal seriously with a world of ideas. Um, I happen to be now at Glasgow University. And you know, it's interesting that ancient universities had very close links with either the monarchies or the Pope. In fact, in Europe, the Pope was a, uh, had a very significant influence. Pope Nicholas V uh, 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 issued what they call a papal bull, in a charter, in other words, in 1451 for the founding of Glasgow University. And, and it's, so it's, it's over 600 years old, yeah, or, or coming to 600 years old, sorry. And uh, you can see that uh, this is how uh, uh, the ideas of the world uh, came together. Adam Smith, who we are very proud of, of course, uh, uh, was part of uh, uh, this university that I am now privileged to be uh, in. You know, look at these cloisters at the bottom here. Uh, I often walk through uh, in, in sort of a, 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 because it reminds me of the contemplative life, you know. Uh, the monks were all very often associated with, with uh, learning and universities and religion were very much uh, bound together in, in, in this pursuit of understanding and knowledge. So what about the function of a university? Well, uh, the justification as uh, Whitehead says is, is that it, is, it preserves a connection between knowledge and the zest for life. And very importantly, it's about imagination. It's about imaginative acquisition of knowledge. A university is imaginative or it is nothing. Whitehead says, you know, uh, a fact is not just a mere fact. Uh, it has to be pregnant with implications. Uh, when, you, when you acquire a fact, it must have uh, ramifications for our understanding. So you go to a university uh, to develop imaginatively uh, an understanding of the world. Um, so when, when professional people go into a university, it's not just about knowledge, but how to use that knowledge. Uh, Whitehead has a wonderful saying. He says, knowledge does not keep any better than fish. You know, after a while, it starts to smell. So that's what universities are about. It's about welding together experience, energy, and the imagination. So academic scholarship is really about expansion of horizons of comprehension, you know, opening us up to ideas that we would never have comprehended. I don't know how many of you, for example, attend art history lessons or lectures or seminars or philosophy seminars. I have learned so much from being exposed to ideas that are entirely out with uh, the domain of, of, of management scholarship, so to speak. Uh, um, and, and, and this is one of the great uh, things about being part of an ancient university where uh, you, you, it's part of the tradition to be to, to connect and be relate uh, to, to, to be uh, a part of the community of uh, thinkers uh, who deal with ideas well beyond that of the world of business and management. Um, it's about refinement of our thinking, enlargement of the imagination, uh, 
it's very much about appreciating uh, how knowledge is created and what are its limitations. You know, we are purveyors of knowledge, but how many of us really are aware that, uh, that, the, that creating knowledge itself uh, has uh, comes with uh, certain uh, responsibilities about understanding its limitations, uh, where our, how our perspectives affect uh, the, the kind of knowledge we produce. Um, it is about developing and helping to forge a raison d'etre for human action. Why do we act? But in my view, always beginning with a concrete empirical observation. Scholarship without connecting with the real world of live, lived real world of experience is not scholarship, it seems to me. And this is the reason why I say uh, rigor must be always linked to relevance. True rigor, that is. What about university research? Well, Immanuel Kant has a wonderful uh, 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 phrase. He calls it sapere or dare. Dare to know. Why dare to know? Because sometimes it's frightening to know. Daring to doubt what we think we know already. Daring to let go of what we thought was obvious. Daring to move upstream and take the road less traveled. I don't know if uh, how many of you have come across the work of Robert Frost, uh, the poet, uh, the road uh, not traveled, uh, not taken. I think that's, that's uh, it's, it's, it's about going on a journey uh, to explore for yourself. Daring to question conventional wisdom. Um, the educational philosopher, Alan Bloom, uh, in 1987, wrote a book when I was just beginning to, starting to, to, to get into the academic world, so to speak. And I read this and I thought, my goodness, this is really what, what's, been, what's happening to society. Uh, and he, of course, in his case, he was critical of American universities for letting the students down, apparently. Um, he says, the university must compensate for what individuals lack in a democracy. It must be contemptuous of public opinion. The great democratic danger is enslavement to public opinion. So in other words, academics, by definition almost, have to be quite controversial. They must go against the grain of public, public opinion. If they don't, how else can they forge new understanding? Now, sadly, uh, Alan Bloom was hounded out of office uh, for his controversial uh, uh, ideas. Uh, but I do think uh, that uh, this is what, uh, well, uh, in a way, he, he was uh, advocating this Socratic approach. And... Like Socrates, he suffered a, a not very pleasant fate, so to speak. Um, so in academia, reflexive awareness is, is critical. In making our, our, our knowledge claims, we have to realize that all of us, bar none, uh, inherit a way of understanding the world, an observational order and a conceptual order, so that what we observe is not by any means uh, impartial facts. Facts do not simply speak for themselves. We have to interpret these facts. Uh, and that is the, 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 the important lesson as a researcher. Uh, it gives us a bit more humility, so to speak. Um, research, why do we do research? Because research is about searching again and again, interminably. If we had found an answer, there would be no more need to do research. And the reason why we do research is because somehow we never get to the end of our researching. Uh, why this is the case? Well, uh, I will just say it has a lot to do with the limits of language. 
uh, and representation. And uh, uh, it, it, I, I can say a little bit more about this uh, if, if, if anybody's interested. But uh, so the task of research, therefore, is to urge our observation beyond the boundaries of its completeness, apparent completeness, and, uh, and science beyond its delusive air of finality. Well, uh, how do we, I said the universities are about imaginatively acquiring knowledge. How do we cultivate this uh, entrepreneurial imagination? Uh, what do we mean by the unthinkable? I've thought about this for quite a bit, and this is how I would uh, try to uh, portray. Let's start with uh, Donald uh, uh, Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld famously uh, had uh, this quote, there are known knowns, the things we know, we know. We also know that known unknowns, that is to say, we know there are some things that we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns. Once we don't know, we don't, if you don't know, you don't know, you don't even know where to start. And the way I have uh, 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 portrayed this is to say that no knowns are routines. They're so obvious to us that we don't even think about it. Hmm? We know that we know. Known unknowns are problems. Uh, we know, for example, uh, 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 SARS COVID 2 uh, causes uh, corona, uh, 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 SARS uh, causes. Uh, co uh, COV2 causes COVID-19. Um, but we don't know how exactly the causes, uh, the, the, the links are, are linked, or perhaps you could say cancer. We know about cancer, but we don't know uh, the cures for cancer. We, we haven't found sufficiently enough understanding uh, about, uh, so it's a problem still. Hmm? But there are things that we don't even know is a problem. We haven't yet, and we're just beginning to realize, for example, that climate change is a problem. It's beginning to seep into our consciousness. So the unknown unknown comes at us from an oblique angle. It is about shifting awareness and shifting paradigms. So why is this the case? Because there's a form of forms of thought. You know, that I, I mentioned earlier on, uh, Whitehead was saying about observational orders and conceptual orders. There's a form of form of thoughts. And like the air we breathe, such a form is so translucent, so pervading, and so seemingly necessary that only by extreme effort can we become aware of it. For example, we don't even ask ourselves a question, how does alphabetic system affect the way we think? It has a huge effect. Those people who live in countries which are, for example, in China, uh, where you use a different system uh, of notation rather than the alphabet, will have a very different form of forms of thought. And that's why you see the world quite differently. These are think, questions that uh, are not addressed uh, in much of academia let alone in management scholarship. And yet, we live in a globalized world. So, uh, what is the unthinkable? The, the best way I can, think, can explain the, this whole idea of the unthinkable is to start with a line. I call this line norm. What do I mean by, by, by norm? Norm is what's normal. I walk into my room here, I flick on the switch and the light comes on. That makes me realize, okay, uh, it's working. The, 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 light is, uh, the switch is working, the light is working. Uh, and every, every day, I, every afternoon I come in and I flick on the switch and it comes on. So norm leads to expectation. Yeah? Every day I walk in, I flick on the switch, it comes on, that means the next day, I, I walk in and I expect the light to still come on. Or I go to my car, I turn on the ignition switch and it, it, uh, the, the engine starts. Uh, when I do this repeatedly, I end up developing an expectation. One day, however, I go to my car 
I turn on the ignition and what actually happens is a deviation from my expectation. And that's where a problem happens. A problem is associated with your expectation. And your expectation derives from what's norm, what's normal, so to speak. So you don't have expectations, you don't have any problems. Simple as that. Actually, this, this framework was developed by NASA in the 1950s uh, as part of their, 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 uh, their, uh, aero, well, their project, okay? But where does, where, how does this norm get formed, so to speak? The answer is through a kind of invisible framing. And these are values, beliefs, assumptions. And this is what we mean by a paradigm. So you can't change paradigm so easily because you most of us don't even know that we are uh, framed by a paradigm, uh, paradigmatic mentality. When we say, uh, think out of the box, you know, you hear this phrase, that's, that's a wrong, wrong, wrong thing to say. The first thing to ask is, where did the box come from? That is a real question. If you understand where the box is from, and the box is this invisible framing that I'm referring to, then you can sort, you can reframe the problem. Right? So that's thinking the unthinkable. So how to learn to think the unthinkable? Unfortunately, it's never straightforward. Uh, I use a, this painting, which is by Hans Holbein, to try to allude to how uh, we actually become gradually aware uh, that our framing of the world uh, uh, constitutes a, a little bit of an issue. This is called the ambassadors, this painting. The two gentlemen, finely clad gentlemen that you see there are uh, not ambassadors of, uh, of countries, actually, but they are ambassadors of their epoch. This is 1533, and uh, they are ambassadors of the Renaissance, of the, the newfound science, beginnings of science, of precision, of uh, scientific understanding, and so forth. And if you look at the background, you can see all these scientific, uh, uh, precise instruments, musical instruments, uh, the globe, and, and so for all. So this is about the triumph, the celebration of the triumph of scientific uh, precision over what was previously religious beliefs, superstitions and so forth. But against all this, what Holbein did was with all this triumphalism, he was a lot more circumspect and he thought, no, no, no. Uh, science is great and wonderful, but we must never underestimate the unknown. And so he painted this strange little object in the front. I, I hope you can see it. Uh, this front part here. Uh, I don't know if you can tell what this is, but you will see the way to look at it is to enlarge it and then Look at it from about 27 degrees from the side, uh, downwards along the line of the, of the image. And then you will see that it is a skull. And what is a skull? The skull represents the unknown. So Holbein was saying to these people, don't be so confident. Uh, uh, there is a world of this unknown uh, which will come back to bite you if you think you are so arrogant as to know the world precisely through your science. So humility is important, to be aware of the limits of our knowledge. So the entrepreneurial imagination uh, is something that I've written about. It's really uh, about making connections and ideas through this per peripheral awareness. And this this, this way of uh, making connections 
is applicable whether you are in academia or in the business world. Because in the business world, you have to reconfigure resources, consumer needs, and market conditions and so forth to produce uh, value-added services and products. Likewise, in academia, you reconfigure ideas, uh, bring uh, interesting insights together to reconfigure the, your theories. Both rely on this paradigm sh shifting capacity. Um, so I want to then now move on to this idea of relevation. Uh, how do you achieve relevance through academic rigor? I, I, I coined this term from two Latin roots, uh, relive, uh, uh, which, which uh, is uh, it's about bring, raising up or in this instance, raising up of awareness. In levation is also a medical term, uh, to raise up slowly. To relevate, therefore, is to provoke through scholarly means a heightened sensitivity to peripheral event happenings, hidden relationships, and slowly emerging trends. So if you think about what was happening in Wuhan in January, this December, January this year, uh, last year, uh, and January this year, most of the rest of the world didn't think very much of it. No, most of the rest of the world didn't see this as uh, uh, an issue that, that was going to affect their lives uh, in, in the way we, now, we are now experiencing. You know? So to relevate is to realize that changes that are remote, far away, small things can have dramatic consequences. You know, I think it was uh, 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 what's his name again? Uh, I'm just trying to remember the 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 name of the the the, the chap uh, Intel, uh, the the CEO of Intel. What's name uh, Robert Andy Grove. Andy Grove, that's right. Yes, Andy Grove. He was the one who said. Uh, uh, when snow melts, it starts at the edges. It doesn't start in the center. You know, many things happen at the edges of, of life. You know, and 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 we are often unaware of it. And because most often they are almost imperceptible, sensitivity to these peripheral events happening is crucial uh, for recognizing how uh, relevant they can be. And so rigor is about sensitivity as well uh, to these empirical events happening. So I want to differentiate rigor into two different types of rigor, scientific rigor and artistic rigor. Scientific rigor is what we normally are familiar with, uh, dealing with uh, theories, symbols, concepts, categories, uh, you're expected to be familiar with the relevant literature. You're expected to be methodically careful about how you gather the data, uh, about logical soundness in making your knowledge claim. That's all part of the scientific rigor. But all this scientific rigor is worthless without really grounding it in empiricals, solid empiricals, the raw experience, the things that happen in the world before concepts come in, so to speak. It's very difficult. William James calls it radical empiricism. Uh, not the false empiricism that we have today, which is, uh, I'm afraid a, a lot of people do. Uh, you interview people, you talk to them, or, or even uh, you read reports and stuff like that. That's not real empiricism. Empiricism is when you are there actually observing what's going on, and then absorbing uh, uh, the nuances that are uh, the signals that are coming forth. It's about what uh, uh, John Ruskin, the, the uh, uh, artist, art uh, critic, and reformer, calls an innocence of the eye. And uh, this is only found in the art history, art theory literature. Uh, Anton Aaron Swig in the hidden order of art calls it a, a, an uncompromising democracy of vision. In other words, you refuse 
to allow your, your vision to be dictated by concepts. You see the thing in, in a kind of childlike, pristine observing manner. Without that, you generate poor data. And with poor data, you get uh, uh, inadequate or inappropriate surrogate indicators, which provide misleading evidence that lead to wrong decisions and eventually unexpected consequences. So what does artistic rigor entail? It's this uncompromising democracy which refuses to make any prior distinction uh, when you make an observation. Uh, as I mentioned, William James calls it a radical empiricism. And uh, in Whitehead's uh, Science and the Modern World, he talks about the fact that uh, even if you understand all about the sun and all about the atmosphere and all about the rotation of the moon and all about the rotation of the earth, you may still miss the radiance of the sunset. Nothing substitutes for this concrete experiencing. So I think the message I'm trying to get at, get at is that we are not sufficiently attentive to uh, refining our capacity for observing, uh, for uh, the, the fidelity of our observation. So it's about pure seeing. Hmm? To see clearly is poetry, prophecy, religion, all in one. And this is what allows uh, uh, great corporations like uh, um, uh, Panasonic, Matsushita, the, 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 the whole Japanese conglomerate. Um, Matsushita, uh, uh, if, if you're interested, uh, his work is fascinating because he's written quite a lot on philosophy of management and stuff like that. And he talks about uh, the Sunao mind. The Sunao mind is this kind of meek, humble, childlike, uh, innocent mind that is open to and receptive to all things. And, and in a sense, this is what has to be uh, worked at uh, so that our observations are pure, if you mind. Um, and that's what allows William Blake to see in the, the, the world in a grain of sand. Uh, this is a painting by Marguerite. Uh, it's called La Clairvoyance. Uh, foresight, if you mind. Why? Magritte is looking at the egg, but what does he paint? He doesn't paint the egg. He paints a bird. That's potential. Close observation leads to capacity to see the relevance of this potential. Relevation. So, let me end with a little story. I don't know how many of you uh, have been to Japan, to particularly to places like Kyoto, where you have a lot of these uh, uh, Japanese tea houses, so to speak. Uh, this, is a, this is Zen Master Tanaka, let's call him. And Zen Master Tanaka is 90 years old. And uh, he's uh, the um, grandmaster of uh, the tea ceremony, which is famously uh, practiced in, in Japan. I've actually been to some of these places. Uh, but you know, this whole ceremony can take several hours. And uh, outsiders are, un are, are puzzled by why it takes so long to just prepare a cup, a, a cup of tea, so to speak. So there's this anthropologist from California, uh, from Berkeley, California, a young anthropologist who's uh, thinking, well, why do the Japanese make such a big fuss of this tea ceremony? I shall go and visit Zen Master Tanaka and I will uh, show that this is nothing more than a bit of a hocus pocus, if you might. So he ends up uh, in Kyoto and he's uh, in, uh, in, he, he he ends up at the doorstep of Zen Master Tanaka. And Zen Master Tanaka invites him in and they both sit cross-legged on a the, on the mat and he puts two cups, one in front of himself and one in front of the visitor. And then he starts to 
uh, make the tea and then he, 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 he pours the tea into first his own and then the visitor's cup. Now he's 90 years old, so his, his, his hands are pretty shaky. Eventually, when he finishes his own, he starts to fill in the visitor's cup. And the visit, visitor's cup then fills up, but he keeps pouring. And the young uh, visitor thinks, uh, poor old man, he can't coordinate his movement, but I shall be polite and I'll pretend that uh, I'm, 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 the, I'm not seeing that the, the, the tea is spilling on the floor and so on. More tea goes in and the young chap says, why is he not stopping? My goodness, can't he see? It's now all seeping over the mat. More tea goes in. Eventually, the young man, he can't take it anymore. He says, Zen master, please stop. Can't you see? The, 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 my cup is already so full of tea. No more tea will go in. And the Zen master looks at him and says, you are exactly like this cup of tea. You are already so full of knowledge. No more knowledge will go in. Unless you empty your cup, you will not understand what this Zen, this tea ceremony is really all about. In order to grasp, you sometimes have to first release. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Um, this is a very interesting way to um, to, to to finish your your point. Um, just want to welcome the, the questions, uh, comments, anything really from, from the participants. Feel free to unmute yourself and and ask or uh, a question or make a comment, whatever you feel you want to say. Dr. Chia? Yes, hi. Can, can I, um, I think this is fantastic, and I'm sitting here thinking, my goodness, um, where were you when I was a young undergraduate? Um, but my question is, for some of us who are in, in business schools, yeah. who are on this treadmill, you know, <laughs> on the way to the PhD, being yeah. told you've got to get your literature review in by this date, and do these other things, you know, start your empirical study by this other date, and we can mm -hmm. sense being on the treadmill, what would you say, what would your advice be to those of us who feel like we're stuck there? Well, well, well uh, I, I, I would recommend uh, a two-pronged attack, so to speak. Uh, the system has its regulations and its requirements. You do the minimum. You, you, uh, you, you conform uh, superficially, so to speak. And then you get on with your own interests. See, because ultimately, your PhD and your research uh, has to be of great interest to yourself, yeah, and has to be motivated by your own conviction. You know, if you're going to defend a PhD or a piece of uh, uh, article that you have written, uh, you must be absolutely persuaded by the ideas. You know, so deal with the ideas. I, I tend to tell my young colleagues, you know, uh, I know you are, you are under incredible pressure to publish and stuff like that, you know. But if you have not refined your ideas uh, uh, and you try to get them published, yeah, it will come back. So, so stick to uh, fine-tuning and honing your ideas and, and drawing, making interesting connections and so forth. And then... Uh, the, the, the editor, the reviewers, the editors will say, I may not agree with this, but there's something here uh, that uh, needs uh, to be allowed to expression. You know, uh, it's like, we, it's the same thing like, uh, like, uh, like uh, an entrepreneur. We are not entrepreneurs. An entrepreneur comes up with a product, you know, uh, maybe initially the prototype is not very good, you know, but, but we have to believe 
that our pro prototype uh, is going to actually make a difference to, to the world outside there. Yeah, and, and therefore, uh, I concentrate on refining my prototype uh, so that when somebody eventually sees the potential, they say, my God, this is, this is really something. We must have it. So, so you have to love your question. <laughs> Sorry? You have to love your question. Yes, yes, you, you have to love it. I mean, I don't know why people do PhDs when, they're, you know, when, when they don't have some real compelling passion about, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I, I, I have supervised PhDs and, and I, I say to them, what, what is the question that keeps you awake at night? If it doesn't keep you awake at night, forget about doing a PhD. You know, uh, passion is everything. And here's the beauty about it. When you start to write with this kind of conviction and passion, somehow it affects your craftsmanship, so to speak. And, and you are able to then uh, uh, express this inner sense uh, to whoever is reading it. It comes across. You know, so... so um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm old school. I still think that Emerson was right when he said, uh, you know, make a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your doorstep. So, so, you know, let the world come to you because you've got wonderful ideas. But concentrate on ideas. <laughs> okay. I, I, and so, so, I mean, if I would say... Uh, when I say concentrate on ideas, I mean take something that has been everybody seems to be have taken for granted and start to unpick it and embellish it, enrich it, and so forth. You know? And then you think, oh, wow, this is not just so straightforward. And there's a lot more to it. And that's what makes uh, the reader... Uh, uh, whether it's a PhD thesis or a publication, that's what makes a reader, uh, 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 or if you might, seduces the reader into in, in, into buying into your 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 concept, your theory, and so forth. So. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, this is Lisa. I'm from India. Uh, oh, yeah. I read your uh, the chapter, the book chapter you had about uh, uh, how to become uh, a responsible management scholar. Uh, oh yes. Yes. Scholar. Yeah. It's a very compelling um, and extremely insightful piece of literature that I have ever, ever read till now. So thank you. My question is this. Uh, the advice I read in that, would that be different for a man and a woman? Don't take me wrong. I don't want to open a can of worms here. But uh, especially mm -hmm. from context of a working woman, which is, it's very different from that of a man. I don't know how it is globally, but in India, it is like that especially yeah. at my home, I can speak for myself. How would your advice be different for a man and a woman? Oh, gosh, uh, uh, I'm not a woman. <laughs> so obviously, uh, uh, I can't uh, be inside. Uh, uh, but I can uh, have some sympathy with uh, the, 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 the large, the greater difficulty uh, of, uh, of 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 uh, having to claw your way through uh, a system that is not necessarily uh, in uh, design to accommodate you, so to speak. Now, in my case, uh, as I said, uh, uh, the, the difficulty was uh, a, a few things. For example, uh, I didn't have I I, I want. I wanted to engage in this world of ideas, but I didn't have a, a, a university degree. So in a sense, it was a, a, an, an, an obstacle for me to somehow find a way of overcoming that, right? Uh, uh, 
I, in, 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 I come from Singapore, and in Singapore, it's not easy to go and to, to, in my time, uh, to, to actually get, uh, get a, 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 a from, for reasons of money and all kinds of reasons, uh, I couldn't uh, find a way to, to educate myself uh, to that level. And I had to go out to work you know, uh, at a young age to, to try and uh, uh, somehow bootstrap myself, so to speak. So in the parallel uh, is uh, for a woman, uh, obviously uh, in, in, in cultures, especially where the woman's role is perceived to be uh, supportive rather than uh, primary, so to speak, there's always this additional uh, 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 difficulty that you have to circumvent, so to speak. Um, but having said that, Think about, I mean, today or yesterday, we saw two uh, uh, Nobel Prize winners, uh, women, uh, who uh, 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 in uh, uh, gene editing and so forth, you know, somehow they have been able uh, to, to overcome and they would have had to work. But the beauty is this, in my view, the harder you have to work, the richer the fruits of your labor you know nothing comes easy you know uh, I I have struggled actually I mean if a, a lot of people don't realize this my, my background I, I came from very very in Singapore in the 1950s we were really truly truly third world not like what you see today you know uh, uh, and I, uh, I I I I I I grew up as a, in, in, as a 10, 12 year old reading uh, uh, my Enid Blyton books under paraffin lamps. You know, no, uh, no electricity, no running water and stuff like that. So we all have to overcome these fine ways. But when you do so, the product of your experience is, will enrich your, your, your mind, your thoughts. And, and it will come across in what you write. That's why great, uh, there are many uh, novelists and, 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 and writers and so forth, women who have uh, been able to articulate their deep experiences and, and truly profound. Yeah? Uh, and so I'm not sure that I can find a, 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 an answer to your question, but you know, uh, all I can say is uh, if you can uh, circumvent this and then uh, hang on in there and, and overcome these uh, clear societal structures that disadvantage you, um, the, the, the output will be far, far more fulfill, fulfilling for you. Uh, with your permission, I just wanted to all, add yeah. something to this. Yeah. Which is that after reading, before reading literature, I had this view of the world that you know there are these haves and have-nots in the system of creation where mm. the haves belong to those universities and management institutes where you have you know a grade studying a grade curriculum everything is available even then there's you know like this unstructured but for people who belong to a more disadvantaged situation things are even more unstructured there are so many more challenges yeah. so we are we would be basically the have-nots but then after reading your paper, uh, your the chapter, and like you just said, it's, mm -hmm. you know, the more adversities there are, the more you try to overcome them. And that experience itself speaks for itself. And after reading that, the perspective, the paradigm changed. There was such a paradigm shift. And I was thinking, by being a have not, I'm more privileged than them because I have the privilege of experience scrambling and trying to find a hope. And at the end of it, when I look back, I think I, 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 would, I would make the... Uh, the have and they they might be the have not I don't know probably so th thanks for this thank you so much not, not at all like uh, I mean as uh, you know uh, as I said we we all uh, struggle in our own ways my you know just to say my first job uh, as a as a as an 18 year old uh, was standing on a single plank uh, with two ropes hanging from the side of a ship grinding the welding of uh, the side of a ship for 14 hours a day in the hot sun in Singapore, you know, and, and, and that, that was, uh, that was to earn me enough money to pay, 
to go to college to do a, a diploma in mechanical engineering. Robert, may I ask you a question? Um, sure. you, you alluded to, in your presentation, you talked about um, enlargement of imagination. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about how uh, we can go about doing it or perhaps something well, 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 on yes, experience? Yes, surely, surely, surely. You know, uh, the advantage of not being uh, 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 sort of educated through the normal system of uh, uh, school, high school, uh, uh, university, then PhD and so forth, is that um, you don't get constrained by disciplinary grooves. You know, when I came into academia, uh, all these, these dif disciplinary divisions between, for example, um, 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 psychology and management and sociology and philosophy and art history and so forth uh, didn't mean much to me. So I said, well, I'm in a university and I had a good supervisor, you know, and he, he said to me, well, why don't you go and attend all this? You're in a university. I said, oh, okay. And of course, I went and sat in to uh, listen to incredible French uh, uh, philosophers uh, people like Derrida and so forth. And I thought, what is he talking about? Absolute nonsense. Never heard of, you know, didn't, didn't understand a word of what you're saying, but something was there, you know. Uh, but then, gradually, 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 you persist, you know, you persist. Effort is needed, you persist. And then, wow, ah, I see. The connection I had with Derrida was incredible because my business experience, one of the biggest predicaments I had, which led me to wonder, and is still here, still with us, is how come there is this intractable gap between representations and reality? In my case, it was a very simple one in the business world. I would wake up, I go to the office and my customer would call me and say, Robert, uh, uh, can, you, uh, can you send us uh, uh, 20 million cans of Heineken, uh, Heineken, Heineken cans? You know, we produce cans for the, for the beer industry and so forth. Uh, can you uh, ship us uh, 20 million cans of beer for, for Heineken? I said, oh, I, uh, let me go on my computer. Click, click, click. Oh, we have 30 million stock. Yes. Certainly, no problem. You know what? I call my stockkeeper and he says, Robert, sorry, uh, we didn't update it. We don't have 30 million. <laughs> so what? We only have 10 million. I said, but why the hell didn't you update this? Oh, uh, it was uh, 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 an oversight. Uh, okay. Uh, then there was such a thing called MRP2. We install MRP2, call, cost us a million quid to, to install MRP2 to get a precision stocks uh, level supply. Still 99.5% accuracy. Why can't you get 100%? Well, I never understood until I understand now because the world is always moving and language statistics, mathematics, all capture static states. Representations always miss reality, inadequate to reality. That's why our theories are always partial. That's why we always have to keep researching and we will never end. And what Derrida taught me was that that, that is the case. Sorry, yeah. Um, may I ask a question? Sure, hi, hi, Christine. Hi, hi there. Um, so I'm really interested, and it, it's a great concept, the idea of artistic rigor, um, you know, wow. especially comparing and contrasting it with scientific rigor. Um, yeah. And I do understand the bit about raw experience being, okay. um, you know, an element of that. But could you just talk a little bit more about, you know, how do you um, develop that artistic rigor? Okay. <laughs> 
you know, uh, I am now beginning to realize uh, uh, that I have come to the West in order to, to understand why the, the, the missing element in the West is what uh, the, the Eastern world uh, 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 has been long into in terms of things like meditation and stuff like that. You know, uh, but, but let me say that when I read people like John Ruskin, I realized that in fact, he was like a Zen master, so to speak. You know, John Ruskin used to spend hours on end as a child uh, observing the end's movement on the carpet for hours. And when he sat in his, 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 uh, his study in, uh, in, Cornish, in uh, Brentwood in Coniston Waters, looking out through his window, he... he was he would spend hours looking at the at, at the at the mountain range uh, facing him. So he's observing powers of observation. We do not spend enough time refining our powers of, of observation. How this can be so crucial to us is maybe perhaps and practically useful is perhaps best. Uh, uh, illustrated uh, by the Inuits. I don't know if there are any Canadians here or there, but apparently, and I've read this and I, I understand this is true, the Inuits can tell between about 42 different types of snow. I can't. I don't know how many of you can. But for them, it is a matter of life and death. If you, if you, if for us, it's just no. But for them, it means food. It means, you know, and, and they have learned from nature. So nature, the environment, solicits our attention. But sometimes we are too absorbed in our own world to, to, to understand what nature is calling up to us. This is the ecological kind of thinking that we need to save the world the way it is at the moment. You know, we think of the world as a resource. It is not, it is a source. It is a source and it calls up, it invites us. Many anthropologists have studied natural ways of engaging with the environment and with the world. And, and they say, I'm sorry, it's, a, it's, it's raining at the moment now, suddenly. And uh, I hope it's a bit noisy, uh, not too noisy. But, but that's, you know, so, so uh, we are, I think, and I, I'm, I'm guilty of this myself as well. Um, we are too absorbed in our thought processes. So when people talk about mind, mindfulness, actually, it's, it's, in my view, is wrong. It should be mindlessness. <laughs> you know, it, uh, you, 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 should, you should not have, be, have your mind full of anything. It should be empty. It should be empty so that you can actually experience. Uh, uh, how do you train? How do you, how do you train? How do you train yourself to do that? Well, I think you can. I think I think you can uh, uh, try to uh, apprehend phenomenon, uh, 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 learn to apprehend and to, to to rely on your senses more than on your intellect as a starting point. I think that's 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 all I would. Uh, yeah, no, that's really helpful. I think um, learn to rely on your senses more than your intellect. Yeah. That absolutely, yeah, yeah I yeah, get that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, our senses tell us a lot of things uh, uh, that we cannot articulate. You know, uh, uh, we don't have the vocabulary to articulate. Um, so.
Robert, if I heard you correctly, yeah. or if I interpreted it correctly from your talk earlier, what mm -hmm. you were suggesting is that not to take things for granted, but rather question them. Yeah, yeah. But the 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 the, the more important thing is to question uh, ourselves about why we think this these issues are the way they are. We perceive these issues the way they are. You see. Because we bring a framing of understanding to what we apprehend. So it's our own frame of uh, framing that we need to begin to uh, uh, examine and explore and, and revise and constantly revise, so to speak. If we take the notion of relevance, which we often talk about relevance in relation to practice or policy. Yeah. Um, in your own experience, how do you take you know, your sort of, your ability to reflect and question or reframe things mm -hmm. um, in academic settings and into practice, because I understand okay. you teach and you consult practitioners. Yeah, uh, I, I actually tell, I, have, I haven't done this for quite a while now because I, I'm, I'm, I don't do much, uh, but I used to be very involved in large sort of corporate uh, executive, senior executive programs and British Airways, uh, uh, several, uh, you know, uh, other corporations and stuff like that. And uh, uh, the, my last one was uh, um, Babcock. I don't know whether you're familiar with Babcock uh, PLC. Uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a large British corporation here. And, and, and I was in Strathclyde University then and uh, we had a connection with it. Anyway, they, would, uh, they wanted some sort of executive development thing for the senior executives. And uh, I did strategic uh, scenarios and thinking with them, basically. And, uh, and uh, one of the things that I, I started with was to say, look, you know, um, you've been in your uh, specialisms, your, your business world for 25 years or so. Uh, I can't actually say very much to you about your expertise, your field of expertise. What I can do is to help you to see things differently. And that's the only contribution I can make. Okay. And uh, so then uh, I work with them uh, on, on becoming more sensitized to the differences and changes that uh, happen in their environment. Okay. So, so in, in scenarios thinking, for example, uh, you start with changes that are going on around the world and you pick up a newspaper, you pick up Financial Times, for example, and you say, okay, let's go from page one to page 20 or whatever and, and see what, what the news is reporting. Things are happening, you know, Trump's getting uh, COVID, uh, whatever, okay. Uh, all the changes are happening. And you ask yourself, what does this mean uh, for us? And you say, well, but he's, he's there, you know, or oh, China is doing uh, a new vaccine, you know, what does this mean? Uh, so, so, so this is a way to begin to, to play with your imagination, to, 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 to stretch the possibilities of connection uh, in Contrary to a lot of people's understanding of scenarios thinking, I don't think scenarios thinking is about best case, worst case, or whatever, likely case or whatever. It's not about that. It's about cultivating intellectual agility. Agility, you know, making connections and having the agility to see possibilities where other people are not able to. That's it. Uh, years ago, uh, uh, there was a book uh, written by the chairman of uh, one of the large Korean corporations. I can't remember whether it was Samsung or, or, or one of the other ones, uh, but uh, it was called, uh, the book title was called Everything is Paved, Every, uh, Everything, Every, Every Streets are paved, paved with gold. It's paved with gold. That's right. Yeah, and uh, and uh, 
And the, the simple message was, uh, this chap went around, uh, he, he apparently flew around the world for about 100 days a, a year. And, and he brought with him an old Korean philosopher. And, and, and everywhere he, he went, he would say, uh, this is what I see. What do you see? You know? And then he eventually came to this point. He said, you know, the problem is uh, wherever I go around in the world, I see possibilities. Mm -hmm. People who don't see possibilities is their problem. They, they, their minds are already blocked up. Okay. So all, and of course, as you know, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Chinese word, uh, uh, crisis is also opportunity. You know, uh, I suspect that in Greek, they have a similar equivalent. You know, I don't know whether there are any Greeks here, but uh, the, the Greeks also, uh, Greek words are also very, very, uh, uh, have, have double meanings uh, in, 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 this, in, in this sense. For example, pharmacon is, 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 a, is a cure, but it's also a poison. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure if I've answered your thing, uh, Christine, but uh, let's... Was there anyone else who wanted to ask a question? Robert, thank you so much for your presentation. I was just inspired by this uh, scenario building you talked about a minute ago. Uh, uh, how, how do you um, deal with people that kind of question this kind of thinking? I myself uh, like to do that. Uh, War's best can scenario building and everything that might happen in between. But I sometimes get this feedback that, uh, why do I do this to myself, you know? <laughs> as, as I explained, uh, I say to them, uh, forget about the idea that it is about uh, finding out best case and worst case and likely case and so forth. That's not what, that's not what scenario thinking is really about. Mm -hmm. See, thinking is about how, uh, about uh, learning how to create connections, you know, uh, plausible, coherent, not necessarily true. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, when you see, and, and it, all, it all, everything starts with change. Everything starts with an observation of change. An observation of change a change of policy, a change of regulation, a change of circumstance, everything. Uh, uh, the, 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 it must trigger some kind of a response that says, um, even the environment, the environment, uh, 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 you know, leaves are falling, you know, uh, it triggers some response. Uh, what does this mean? Autumn is coming. What does this mean? Uh, and so forth. You know, temperatures are going to drop. What does this mean? And so that's how renovation is really all about. Okay, creating connections. Thank you so much. Yeah. So why, why is this necessary? Sorry, uh, uh, just carry on. Uh, it's necessary because in today's world, it is so unpredictable that any other form of sort of rigid planning and so forth is actually quite uh, uh, futile. Mm. So the opposite to planning is quick responsiveness. And quick responsiveness comes from being, being able to see possibilities and make connections. How many of you have come across uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb's work on uh, anti-fragility? Uh, if you haven't, have a read because it's actually quite interesting in that it's it's really about this idea that <clears throat> instead of thinking about uh, about uh, robustness, you know, most people think that uh, if if something is fragile, the opposite of fragile is is being robust. Uh, but uh, his argument, and I agree with him, is it's not about being robust; it is about being anti-fragile. Anti-fragile is 
a predisposition that sees chaos and change and uh, disruption and so forth as opportunities, possibilities. Every, if you might use the word bifurcation, for example, uh, is an opportunity for something new to flourish. Nature teaches us this. Situations teaches us this all the time. Robert, if I may ask another question. Um, I mean, it's not only in practice, but also in academia, you've written papers where you, in essence, challenge some of the notions or taken for granted ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and for example, your recent paper, Strategy and Practices. Yeah. Um, I was wondering how you, how do you set off, you know, where you perhaps you question and mm -hmm come up with a different point of view on that and yeah. go, go about articulating it, perhaps just as a practical example for those of us who are aspiring scholars. Oh, okay, uh, on that particular paper, uh, it has to do with the idea of practice. And I have pondered about this question of what do we mean by practice for quite a long while, you know? So when I, uh, maybe about, 10 odd years ago, came across the work of social theories of practice, like those of Bourdieu in particular, uh, Pierre Bourdieu. I thought, gosh, here's someone who understands practice in a much more, much richer, more profound way than many people think about practice. You know, uh, when we say practice, you know, the word is quite ambiguous. It, it can mean several things. It can mean, for example, uh, I, 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 I practice my golf swing, you know. Uh, that's one way of talking about practice, you know. Um, but it can mean uh, the pra a medical practice. Uh, uh, that's another way of... Uh, uh, it can mean uh, how we actually uh, go about uh, communicating like this Zoom, this practice of uh, having... Uh, uh, Zoom uh, as a basis for web webinars and so forth, you know. So, so practice. I believe that the word practice is better understood as a kind of tradition, as a kind of uh, social practice, a, a way of engaging with the world. And this is how Bourdieu understood it. And that's why when I came across this literature uh, on uh, strategy as practice, I read quite a bit of it. And I thought to myself, I don't really think they understand practice in this way. And yet they refer to the practice turn in social theory. Okay. And I say, well, no, no, no. Uh, uh, let's, let's get back to this idea of practice as a kind of more socio-cultural thing. Not just something that you and I do, you know, because we are social beings. What we do is affected by our cultural conditioning, historical, social, cultural conditioning. You know, uh, and 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 that's why I say, for example, and I, I use the example of uh, the the Inuits, for example. Uh, uh, that's how they engage with the world. You know. Uh, so practices has a lot to do with the manner in which you respond to the environment, uh, to respond to the circumstance in which you, 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 you uh, the, kind of, the kind of consistency uh, in the way you engage with uh, circumstances. But that at the moment, or in my view, has not been taken into consideration in the strategy as practice literature. That's why I call it strategy in practices. The practices themselves have a, a way of engaging and that is strategic.
Thank you, Robert. Uh, any, so, anybody so, else would like to ask so, any other questions? Yeah. So just to finish that last bit, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. So I take uh, I take a, a a concept which has been more or less taken for granted, and I try to unpick it basically. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, am I allowed to ask one more question? Please. Surely. So uh, in my study, I'm looking at uh, uh, identity of an organization, pro-profit organization, which infuses social values in itself at a point in time. So in a way, I'm looking at the becoming part of the organization. So, mm -hmm. but then when I'm looking at the perception of organization identity, those perceptions may vary depending on the actors I'm looking at. So is it my perception I'm looking at, or am I talking about the perception of the top management or the consumers oh, yeah, or the employees yeah. residing with, you know, within the organization? Well, so well how do I, yeah. Yeah, well, well I, th I think I want to go one step backwards. The one step backwards is, why is this of interest to you? So my research talks about, uh, is it revolves around inclusive business models. And uh, I'm looking at why. Yeah, what, what's the problem that, uh, that prompts this, this interest? So I'm trying to see whether, uh, whether, a, whether a deliberate intervention by the top management in, in, in reforming the identity of the organization can lead to it forming an inclusive business model in future. Okay. Is, it, is that a driver of sorts? So in that process, I'm looking at how uh, how do I perceive how do I look at the perception of you know organizational identity. I'm not I'm not sure whether I'm able to articulate in, it in the right way, but it, it's a, it's an riddle for me to understand which perception do I look at. Do I look at the ah. perception of the employees or the top management? Or well, uh, 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 my my suggestion to you would be to read something called the double hermeneutic. Okay. Uh, this is part of your, you know, don't forget if you're doing a PhD, yeah, it is a doctorate in philosophy, you know, not a doctorate in management. It's a doctorate in philosophy with management as a, as a thing. So, so you have to engage with a philosophical literature and there's a, the issue of, of interpretation, of perception and interpretation of hermeneutics, but uh, there's something that uh, Anthony Giddens talks about, uh, double hermeneutics, which I think is relevant in your case because it is about your perception of other people's perceptions. Do you get my, where I'm coming from? Yes, sir, yes. Uh, so, so, you know, you are, uh, uh, you are perceiving what, and reading what other people perceive to be their issues. So, so you have to come and find, you, you have to find yourself a comfortable resolution for how you deal with this, 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 this uh, uh, quite intractable problem of interpretation. That's why I say, you are not finding truth. You are finding plausible, coherent accounts. Who knows what truth is? Sorry, may I have a question, please? Sure, sure. Ah, hi, back here. Dear Professor Chia, thank you very much for this inspiring and refreshing talk. And in the first part of your presentation, you mentioned about the role of universities. And I was, I'm very curious to know your thoughts about how do you think this um, the, the, this uh, pandemic has changed uh, that it had some impact on the role of universities? Uh, would you would you mind please uh, sharing your thoughts? Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I well, it's it's clear uh, that uh, we do not have this uh, facility now to uh, actually uh, uh, in, uh, engage uh, in even in this forum. Uh, we can. Uh, almost sort of spontaneously connect with each other. There has to be a kind of like sequence of questions, structure, answers, and, you know, which is not really ideal. So that will affect the manner in which we engage. You see what I mean? On the other hand, on the other hand, if you think about 
300 years ago, let us say, in Adam Smith's time, bucket, you know, <laughs> they also didn't have the facility for technology and everything else, and they used to write letters to each other. You know, a lot. So occasionally only they met up and they had a... a, a, a but a lot of time they, they actually wrote to each other. So one good outcome uh, is that uh, you will sit down and write and try to grapple with words uh, on pieces of paper uh, to express your thought. And when you do so, you become far more careful uh, uh, in how you express yourself. Today, uh, we actually have so many uh, conveniences that 300 years ago, they didn't have. I used to think to myself, my goodness, they would use a quilt pen, maybe, huh? and they would sit with a piece of paper, which was probably very expensive in those days. And you sit and you think, how before I write, what my, I must have clarity in my thought before I write. Do you see what I mean? There's no, no such thing called erase and delete. Huh? You don't have our function. You know, when I did my, when I did my PhD, I, 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 I did it on a typewriter. And you had to, to, to erase, you know. Nowadays, you just delete. <laughs> so it's different. Huh? Uh, and what does it do? When the, when the technology makes it too convenient, you become sloppy in your thinking. Because you can delete any time easily. Imagine if paper costs a fortune and you had a, 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 a pen and you had to think, before I write, I can't, I can't delete, I can't erase. You see what I mean? <laughs> so the result is you have, to, you have to be extra careful in what... How, what, just uh, saying what you want to say. So when I think about, I don't know whether you ever get a chance, go to a library and see John Ruskin's 30 over volume, you know, which he said a uh, uh, hundred odd, nearly 200 years ago. And, and, and in his study in, in, in uh, uh, overlooking Coniston water and he wrote all this, my goodness, I think to myself, how did he, how did he think so clearly before he wrote? You know? Thank you very much. That's a discipline that we now need again. Okay? So we need to now be a bit more careful, learn to be rigorous in this way. Thanks so much. I understand. Yeah. Thank you very much. Robert, I have another question inspired Surely. by all the covered questions. Um, with all the technological progress that we do experience, yeah. uh, do you see somehow difference in how dynamics for supply and demand for profession of professor might change in the coming decade or so? Uh, how knowledge is disseminated? Uh, I think it might be uh, some kind of challenge to academia. Uh, just it would be great if you can share your thoughts on this. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, when I joined academia, I would have, at that time, I would have been so happy to be just a lecturer for the rest of my life. You know, uh, I, I said to myself, this is a wonderful life uh, where you have the, the opportunity instead of uh, uh, having to... Uh, uh, day in and day run run a business corporation with big headaches uh, with customers and employees and 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 shareholders and all the stuff. Uh, here's a job where where I, I didn't even think of it as a job. I think here's a, a, a vocation where you know you are allowed to play with ideas and just leave me leave me alone to do it. You know, so so that that that's my mentality. And in the 1980s. It was even, I mean, it's not that long ago. It was very common practice for one whole department to have one professor only. You know, one professor. That was the head of the department and the rest were just senior lecturers, lecturers and so forth. 
you know. My, my supervisor never became a professor in that department. He was a great thinker, in my view, but he, he never became a professor. So, if you want to enter academia, I say to you, please, value the world of ideas first. And if you really achieve great insights and so forth, the world will then reward you for it. Surely. You know? Uh, so, uh, in many ways, um, I can see universities uh, actually, strangely, uh, moving more towards uh, uh, its more traditional kind of role of being uh, on the leading edge of thought. And uh, I can actually see universities shrinking in size, hmm? shrinking, because uh, up to now, a lot of people think of universities as a place to get a get, get a, 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 I don't know, a PhD and then go out and do consultancy and make loads of money, you know. That's, that's, so it's a means to an end. But in a way, all this actually can uh, end up uh, uh, may, uh, reminding us that universities were actually originally places where you went away to contemplate the world and in a way to think about greater possibilities for society and how society can be made to for the greater good you know not just about serving the interests of business but in that sense people will then think well if i if i want to become a successful uh, business person and so forth why do i bother to go to university uh, yes, it's true. But you see, uh, this last quote that I have here from Whitehead, the motive of success is not enough. It produces a short-sighted world which destroys the source of its own prosperity. A great society is a society in which its men of business think greatly about its function. Low thoughts mean low behavior. And after a brief orgy of exploitation, low behavior means a descending standard of life. In other words, if you think I am just here to, 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 to get my degree and to, you know, I'll get my PhD or whatever and go out and make pots of money and become rich and so forth, uh, yes. But in the whole process, there will be a kind of degenerating spiral. Hmm. Uh, we need to think big to understand our problems with treating the world as some kind of a disposable resource. Thank you. Follow-up question on this. I always wonder, I came from industry to do my PhD, and I feel like there's a gap between industry and academia. Yeah. What do you think about that, and how can we actually, uh, not having this low behavior, low thoughts, if sometimes academia is a lot in the theory, theorizing, and there's some mismatch between practice and what the problem is. Actually, yeah, very, very good question. Actually, <laughs> I also thought, how come there was a big gap between the two? But I was already skeptical about the theorizing in academia when I came into academia. That's why instead of going and learning more about uh, uh, in those days about organizational psychology and change and, uh, and uh, organizational theory and design and, and strategy and so forth, I actually became more interested in philosophy because I thought, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if this, uh, 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 but I actually thought a lot of, the, of theor theor theorizing in management and business studies is half-baked. It's neither practical nor even theoretical. Do you know that in, even in the, in, the, in the 1980s and early 90s, uh, when, when uh, uh, my good friend John Child 
uh, went to Cambridge to set up uh, the Judge Institute uh, initially. Uh, he, John, I'm sure, will not. Uh, he, he said to me when I went to visit him, he said, you know, uh, I feel like a pariah in this place because they didn't think management business studies was, uh, was a kind of a, a academic level that was uh, sufficiently, if you might, uh, 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 of, of, of a, a proper academic uh, discipline, so to speak. You know, so so, and and actually, I thought to myself, I understand why, because it's it's half baked. You know, it's not it's not. This is why I suggest that if we want to really make a contribution, we, we have to be very theoretical in order to be very practical. And this, I mean, we're, we're back to Lewin, uh, Lewin, isn't it? A uh, uh, Lewin who says, uh, uh, "There's nothing so so practical." As a, as a good theory, yes. Uh, but I would also reverse it. I would also say there's nothing so theoretical as good practical engagement. Both ways, you know? Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Robert. I'm being conscious of time. Um, yeah. Perhaps, I, I don't know, maybe you could offer us some departing thoughts, um, just like that, uh, the the um, the gentleman in Japan who was serving tea yeah. um, to the young man. I wonder if you have any uh, departing thoughts, uh, wisdom to, to, to give to the doctoral researchers. Okay. Uh, I will say uh, to, to uh, to all of you, I hope this works, uh, this uh, 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 may reflect on this. A lot of sustainable good in life comes indirectly, not directly. The more you aim for profit, the less profitable you become. The more you aim to produce good quality something, Surprisingly, you become more profitable. The more you aim for, uh, 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 you know, making a contribution to society, the more you get recognized uh, for your efforts. Surprisingly, most Nobel Prize winners, uh, you know, they always say, uh, "I never expected to be." I all I was interested in is, I'm interested in the research that I'm doing. You know, and, and that's the case. I don't know if you ever come across uh, 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 John Kay's book, a book titled Obliquity. You know, it's, it's a very popular readable piece. And he says, you know, the happiest people are, are not those who seek happiness. The richest people are not those who seek rich riches. And the most successful corporations are not those that are profit driven. They are profitable, but they're not profit driven. See, my book, Strategy Without Design, <laughs> the side, subtitle is uh, The Silent Efficacy of Indirect Action. In other words, many things happen indirectly. So pursue the thing that is of greatest noble, noble aspiration and the rest will come to you. That's all. Thank you, Robert. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. Thank you. That was great. Right. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks so much, Thank Robert. You. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.